Today I have somebody very special for you. He's the owner of The Beer Shop, an online shop where you find the better beers in Belgium. The owner at Malcroy's Brewing, a small brewery with batches of 80 liter. And he's also the founder of Brewware. If you need clothes during this pandemic that are cool for you as a beer geek, you can find it over there. Welcome, Kevin De Vos. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Uh, it's a bit of a yeah a strange period still for now, but uh, we're, we're keeping it up, uh, trying to uh, be as social as we can online. So that's uh, a good thing. I think we have this kind of things, but of course, uh, like everyone, we we long for uh, for outside parties, going back to the pubs, bars. But uh, still, uh, a few months, I think. So uh, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, so tell me a bit. Um, what is your background? Uh, my background? Well, I never studied for brewery, brewer or something like that. In fact, I was more of a, a motorcycle guy from my uh, first youth till, yeah, 2015, something like that, when I started brewing, in fact. Uh, I was a big motor uh, motorcycle fan. Yeah. I've uh, done races also uh, on the track, racing on the track, things like that. And then it suddenly stopped because I didn't have place anymore to put my motorcycles. So, uh, because we bought a house here, that's how it all started. In fact, we bought a house before I lived in an apartment. We couldn't put uh, a lot of beers in it, so I, I did drink some beers in the pubs, but had no place to, uh, to to store them well, store them properly. So um, when we got here, we had a cellar in the house. For me, that was a very big thing. I said, "Oh, a cellar." perfect to, to store some beers. So I put some beers in it, personal use, that's all. Even had the plans to make a, a little brewery, home brewery in my cellar. But uh, the height of the ceiling was just one meter 70. So after two days I was there, I said, I won't keep this up for, for a few hours. So um, I abandoned that plan and just started putting in racks to putting beers. Uh, that's how it all started with the beers, really cellaring it uh, in my own cellar. Uh, and then I had friends coming over and they said, oh, you have nice bottles here. Don't you sell one to me? I said, no, it's my own stock. You can you can share it, but I won't sell it to you. Uh, but I started playing with the idea. Oh, many people like the, the idea of buying beers that are in a cellar. So um, I started buying some more, just begin just like this, uh, nothing official. Uh, then I found a website who made a little web shop for myself. So in fact, I made a, a shop for myself so I could shop in my own cellar to see what the stock was. <laughs> uh, that's a real stupid idea, but it worked for me. And they had a function, you can put it online for other people too. So one day I said, okay, let's try it. I put it online. The bottles I I can afford to, to, to buy, uh, to sell some, I will do that. And it's started rolling and rolling people uh, knew it they came to me they know hey, it's a good seller of beer so we come and buy it with you and that's how the beer shop id started and so that uh, was 2015 yeah yeah i wanted to yeah. ask which year are we talking about how many bottles did you had uh, in your personal man cave um not that many actually uh, i think it was 2015 and we had i think if i had 80 bottles or something like that. There was the stock, some goose uh, stuff in it, some sour stuff, and most, yeah, barrel aged stuff. Uh, I like myself, and that were worth selling. I didn't put uh, blonde beers or triples in it because that's not really a big thing to to, to age, I think. Um, I started in 2015, so it grew a bit. I had, I think, at the end, it was just all in the cellar. It was 2017, where it changed to the to the garage. Then I had around 150 different beers in the cellar. Um, and then I said, yeah, it's, it's too small. I can't keep up like this. Uh, people had to go through my living room to the cellar with, with, a, with a flashlight to see which beer they wanted to buy. So it was not a good thing. And then I said, OK, let's take it a big uh, step further. Uh, I sold my motorbike, uh, cleaned out the garage, and made a, a cellar above ground. In fact, that's a thing. So all the light here is. Uh, anti-UV, there's no UV light in here, and um, it's all climatized all year through 16 degrees. So um, the beers are a bit sellered above ground. That's uh, that's my main thing, because I'm really about uh, good preserving the, the beers as ideal as I can 
afford. So that's uh, that's my thing. Um, and then also in the meantime, I was still already home brewing because we had uh, the garden here. I did all my brewing outside, uh, but you just yeah a triple, not a normal triple, but. Even then, I didn't like normal triples. I did something with, with smoky triple. I changed things with honey, things like that. It was still basically a triple, of course. But uh, that changed soon when I really started brewing more. I really liked uh, black IPAs. It's my, uh, it's my personal really favorite. I like stouts too, but black IPAs are my, uh, my big thing. If they're brewed well, and I think there weren't enough uh, well-brewed black IPAs, or they're really hoppy and you don't have the, they're just black, that's all the thing, or they really burnt and they don't have hop in it. So it was more like a porter or a stout. So if it's well done and really balanced, I like the style so much. Uh, but there are only a few brewers I knew they made well balanced IPAs, black IPAs. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make it myself. So that was really the start for me to brew something because I found it in my own shop. I, I had one or two, sometimes I had in my stock and people asked it about it so okay there are not enough so i will make them myself and i will sell them uh in the beginning i wasn't allowed to do it of course uh but one day i had to do import beers from america uh, from the us to here and in fact the same license you need to import beers is the same license you need to uh to brew if it's for uh, for customs okay. you have to, to do things and um so okay why not I, I need a license for, for the import, so let's start brewery too. <laughs> I remember well the first day, I, uh, I uh, sent the mail to the guys from uh, from customs here in Belgium, and they phoned me and said, uh, are you really serious? It's You're just brewing, uh, it was in that time, it was 30 liters, from a little spiral, uh, 30 liters. Uh, are you really going to do this? It will give us a lot of work f for nothing. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I will. I have to do the the work too because I have to fill in all the papers. I have all do the customs. So if I have to do it, I think you too. So yeah, they were yeah. not that happy. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, there are a lot of more, so they are more uh, used to it. But in, yeah, in, even in 2017, 18, when I first really things started, they didn't know about that. So um, yeah, that was, that was a good thing. Um, um, and that's why I always keep drawing. The the black IPA around which year did you brew your first one? Because I remember it that it was in Belgium, a quite a new style that I discovered three years ago. But I was very late with that. Um, I think I just can see the first should be two thousand eighteen. Yeah, beginning of two thousand eighteen. It would be the first tryout to do it do it myself. I think that's also the year when I tried uh, the Inkfish from uh, Kromaharing. Brewed Kromaharing. They had an Inkfish, black IPA. I got it in my store the, the first time. I said, yeah, that's what I want. So I didn't know how to, to brew it myself. So I went online searching for recipes to, to make a good IPA. And very accidentally, I came on a, a brewing forum in the time when before Facebook. <laughs> uh, they, had, they had forums like for the uh, Spiral Brewmeister. And it was the guy, I saw the logo from, from a fish. A guy, I put on a black IPA and started looking for it. And apparently that guy was one of the first brewers from Kromaharing. So they had his home brew recipe, he had put it on the forum. So uh, I tried to to figure out uh, how it was brewed like that. And I started doing my own thing with it. And that's how uh, the first, my first black IPA came, came around in fact. So uh, that's also why I did this year. I had the first batch of my black IPA without the white cedar in it. Uh, I wanted to make a tribute to the to Kromaharing and I made a beer. It's called Inkfoss. Their beer call is uh, is called Inkfis, and I made Inkfoss because yeah, my my black name is the Vos, uh, the Fox. So I wanted making something like them, but just a little bit different. So that's my tribute to uh, how it all started for me, in fact, in form of Alcroy Brewery. So, uh, yeah, cool, cool. Uh, Did you ever, um, you're in good contact with uh, the Dutch brewery, the Kroma Haring then? Uh, I know guys a little bit because we mailed uh, just to, to ask them if, if they were okay to using that, that name, even if it was a bit different. Uh, and I knew them already from our online tasting uh, through the importer. I get Kromaharing from Gobsmack uh, import from Christoph. Um, so I really knew them a little bit, but really the contact started with um, 
when we discussed about the label, if I could use it uh, or not. So that was the thing. So I didn't actually met them in real life yet, but uh, maybe we're going to do a collab or something. You never know. Uh, it should be. It could be a nice thing. So, that was my next question. When is the collab coming? <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. We talked about it. So um, maybe it will come. Yeah, this year, next year. I don't know. It would be nice to do something together. Uh, the first thing was guess it. Okay, we'll come to your place. I said, yeah, I think that's maybe a little small to make a call up. Maybe it's better I come to your side. Uh, so you have a bit more of a volume. So <laughs> yeah. And then you started to brew also uh, more Imperial Stout. Yeah, yeah, uh, not that long. In fact, in fact, my first Imperial Stout was the one I made for the crowdfunding. Uh, I did a small crowdfunding to 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 be able to afford the, the first brew kettle because at the time it was a, a little one. Now it will be a, a big one. And then if it's with this image, I can can show you if you want. Yeah. So actually, that's an eighty liter uh, installation. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the eighty liter. You have uh, this brew tools. It's a three uh, three thing. It's a really small thing. It's a bit, yeah. It's, it's a one kettle, a one uh, one kettle uh, vessel, like a, like a spider brewmaster, but it has a lot more functions. So in fact, it's a, it's a good thing. It also has a condenser, so you don't have the, the steam uh, going up. So I can brew here without a lot of steam, uh, which is a good thing because you have the beers in the same in the same uh, place. So uh, I want to keep the the quality for the for the shop the same thing, and for now that works. So that's a good thing. Um, and so I, I made a, the first, I want to do something special. I had already bought a, a little barrel, a 50 liter oak, new oak uh, barrel. Uh, so, okay, that will be something for my crowdfunders, the, the ones who, who spend a little more to give them something really special. Uh, so I bought a 50 liter barrel and I put it full with bourbon. So a blend of bourbon and rum, because it's something nobody did before, uh, I think. Uh, I came to the day, I had a, a beer in the shop, it's called uh, Pleat V uh, from uh, Dark Horse Brewing, uh, I guess, yeah, uh, Bourbon Barrel Aged. I said, oh, Bourbon Barrel Aged, it was a fantastic beer. Uh, I just had one one keg that came to the to Europe because uh, they, they, they made some uh, uh, false uh, errors in the, in the brewery, and so I got that as a replacement for something else. So otherwise, I would never knew it existed. Um, so it was bourbon barrel aged. I, I looked it up and said, okay, what is a bourbon barrel? It sounds intriguing, but I don't know it because I like bourbon, I like rum. So what will you do together? And actually, it turned out it was just, in fact, a double barrel aged beer. First on a bourbon barrel and then on a rum barrel. Splendid beer, nothing to, to say about it. But it's not a bourbon barrel for me. For me, bourbon barrel should be everything in one barrel. So I made it myself. I uh, had a 50 liter barrel. I just every month when I could save a little bit of the money, uh, I bought me a bottle of rum or a bottle of bourbon and I put it in, in the barrel. It kept there for eight months. So the, the bourbon could get in, into the oak. Uh, then I put it off and then I put in the beer. So that was for me a real bourbon barrel aged beer. Uh, it's more subtle because okay, it's new new oak, so it's not the same thing as a real bourbon barrel already used. But the thing is, it, it's full now, so every time the beer comes off, I put in the bourbon back in, so it's not lost. Put it back in, I have to refill it a little bit, top it up, so it's it's full again. But you can't get the, the infections because the alcohol is high enough to, to sanitize the barrel again, so I can reuse the barrel. That's the idea behind it. Um, okay, the tannins will become less of the barrel. That's a natural thing, of course. But for me, I, if I reuse the, the the bourbon, the tannins that are in the bourbon will become stronger and stronger. And in my opinion, or my ID, uh, they will return a bit to the woods also, if I put it in. So it will make a bit of a balance. It will be an experiment to see what it gives uh, after three or four or five fills. Another barrel you can use two times, maybe three times, but then I think that's, uh, that's the most you get out of a barrel. I'm hoping to get more of it and see what it do. It will mellow out a bit, of course, uh, but it's an experiment ongoing and we'll see what it, what it comes in the future. So that was in fact the first stout I made. It's a rather dry stout, uh, eight, nine percent, if I am correct. Uh, not bad, but the, the second one I made now for me is a bit better. Uh, that's, uh, you have to learn also, uh, <laughs> you know, getting to know your, uh, your system, of course. Uh, so this one is now a double mash. I know double mashes work better with a barrel 
to get something out of it. So that's now the new standard that I make for the Stout will be because it uh, gives a much more mouthfeel and something what I really like myself in Stouts. Uh, I like them really full bodied. Uh, they don't have to be sweet, but they have to be full bodied. That's, that's a big thing for me. So I only brew what I like myself, honestly. So I don't make uh, blondes or triples. I also may now made a beer. Uh, I like really peated beers too. That's something oh, cool. not everyone likes. I really like it. Uh, okay, you have, you have barrel aged peated beers because it's a different thing. And you have peated malt beers. Yeah. There's a big difference in, in between, I think. Uh, now I wanted to try first with the peated malts uh, because I had a beer from uh, Allenau today call is I think Estonian and they have a beer Turbahunt 50 and Turbahunt 100. And someone brought me two bottles here and said, you have to try this. You like peat, you will like it. Uh, and really, it was really good. Um, so, okay, I'm going to do it myself. But like I always, I like to go over. So uh, I got in contact with the brewer. It's okay, we tried a 50% uh, heavy, peated, uh, heavy peated malt and we did 100% medium peated malt. So, okay, I would go in between. I make a 57% heavy peated malt. Uh, so that's the fossil fuel. That's the beer that came out. Uh, I like it a lot. There are people who will even, they, they sniff it and they, they will throw it away. But yeah, I really like it. And more people than I thought of do like the beer. So uh, it's a good thing, but it will be a niche market in a niche market. But that's the thing with my volume. I can do such things. That's what I, uh, I like doing. That's the reason why I exactly chose to be small, uh, to, to do crazy things, still good quality, but you can do crazy things. You can't expect someone brewing a uh, 500 or even thousand liters to, to make a beer with uh, that much of uh, heavy peated malt because yeah the return is too much they, they want it's a luxury problem every bottle I make it will sell because there are people and it's so small batch I can do it so uh, yeah. yeah big thing are there beers that you always produce to have in your fixed portfolio yeah yeah that's the thing I do like people trying uh, one offs and all things but I'm more like the yeah the, American style, American vision, I say, make a, a, a core range and then do some specials in between. Uh, of course, my core range isn't that normal, I would say. I don't brew just normal, blunt or things like that. So all my basic range are really special. Uh, like the, the, the white cedar, black IP with the cedar wood. That's my, my first beer and that's something I want always have in the range. I now decided to make it from this year on uh, in two versions, a winter edition and a summer edition. Uh, the winter edition will be a little more heavy, 8% ABV, something like that, and more cedar uh, in it. So really like a winter warm, warmer beer. And a summer edition uh, will be around six, six and a half ABV with a less, less cedar in a little bit more hops in it. So you will have the cedar, but it will more drinkable if you're outside, uh, 25 degrees. I think the the winter edition will be too much for some people, so they, they can have a lighter version. Uh, that's the first beer I always want to have in the range. Uh, the second one, uh, I'm going to see. Yeah, Inkfoss, I'm not sure yet. That's the basic beer from the Black IPA without the cedar. Um, it's a nice beer, but it lacks for me personally a little bit of complexity from the cedar. I like in the cedar. That's not in the infos. So we'll see. Maybe I will do it a few times or like a co-op or something. Uh, and the rest of the beers are seasonals, in fact. So I have um, I have the black, base black, in fact. That's the stout version for the bourbon barrel aged uh, beer. Um, that's, in fact, the things that don't go in the barrel, I will bottle them and it will be the normal stout without barrel aging. And the other version will so be the, the barrel aged bourbon, uh, bourbon version. Um, the next one, the peated one, like I'm drinking now and that's I just made, I will keep it in the, in the range too because I think I was surprised many people like peated beers. And if you like peated beers like me, you go to a shop and oh, you have a peated beer. You take it with you because you know it's most of the time it's one off because it's a, it's a crazy thing a brewer likes to try. But I think if a brewer starts making those peated things, really peated, uh, heavy peated uh, beers more, there will be a there will be a market for it. It will be small. And once people know it's a standard beer in someone's uh, portfolio, 
they maybe will try try it again. So that's for me. I will keep it in. If it doesn't sell, it doesn't matter because I drink them myself. Uh, that's a good thing for me. Um, the another seasonal is a pumpkin beer, something that doesn't isn't brewed much in Belgium yet. Uh, it's starting to come, but every year at the, at the end of the year, you have pumpkin beers or Halloween style beers. Uh, so I want to keep that in the range too, as a seasonal. But every year I will brew it again. Uh, and Franco brew. That's my other one. That's more of a yeah. I think it's a spring beer. Something like that, winter, spring, and it's more of an American brown ale, uh, so American style, so not sweet. It's more uh, of a hoppy ending effect, so uh, it's a bit more bitter. Uh, and it's an oak chips so with white rum to give it more the vanilla that comes uh, to the front. So it's a brown beer, not that sweet, but the vanilla gives it a sweet ID. So that's a thing. Uh, I toast the chips myself again to make only the vanillins come uh, come to the, to the front and the the tannins go to the back. That's my uh, idea for it. So it's not the same thing. Just putting chips in. I, I like to do things differently. That's my uh, all my thing. I like to try the hard way. That's, that's my idea. Um, and so people can follow. I, I like really like the availability calendars on some uh, American websites like Founders has a very good one. You can go to the site and you see what they will brew when and when it will be released. So I, I really copied their ID and I put it on my site too, so people can know when to expect watch beer from the from the brewery. Of course, in between, I, I brew special things that's not, not on the calendar. Uh, that's my little bit of freedom, but it gives me something to know when I have to brew what. So for me, that's a, a good thing to, to get a, a fixed program. Yeah. So that's my core range, in fact. So if you want to see on the side, that's the, the core range I have. And I will make a Naipa every year because it's a style I think in Belgium is not that well known. It's well known from, from abroad, but not in Belgium style. There are not that many well brewed Naipas. They're good beers, but they're not what I expect from, from a Naipa um, kind of beer in Belgium. I tried it before last year. I think it was last year. Yeah, we did it with the All Together uh, program. Uh, the brew, it was uh, the beer from, tell me. All together, other half, I think. They uh, they started the project and they they put out a recipe to everyone, and you could uh, you could brew your own version. It was in fact to, to support hospitality sector. Uh, yeah. I brewed it myself too, in a very small batch, and it really it was the first two weeks. It was yeah, I really amazed myself. Did I brew this? The, the first two days, I drank almost four or five liters from it myself. <laughs> um, it was a real small batch. And after two weeks, you start to feel it goes away. Uh, I think it was three weeks, it was really top. After the third week, it really was go deteriorating like hell. Um, I sold it. I had sold it to a few... I, I call them say, if, uh, this week, if it's not sold this week, I buy them back because I'm not uh, I'm not standing behind it anymore as, as it was because I tasted it every day uh, and every uh, day it, it got off. So uh, that people say, no, you're crazy. It's still very good. Keep it this way. I said, no, I don't like it. After three weeks, it will go out of my own shop too. I'll drink it. If people come by, I can let them taste, but you won't be able to buy it anymore because I'm not supporting it anymore like it was. So, uh, yeah, people call me crazy, but the thing is, I'm in a luxury position. I don't have to live from it, so I can't afford it. If I don't like it like it was anymore, I can't afford to say, okay, fuck it. Just for me, I will drink it. It's not bad, or I'll throw it away. So that's a big, a big plus for me, I think, that I can do it. And I understand another brewery who have to live from it. They can't do that, and I don't expect them to do that neither. But I'm in that position. So why don't do it? Why why should I sell beer that are that good anymore? If I don't, if you don't support them yourself, it doesn't. It isn't a good idea for me to think to to put them out. So, yeah. and that's what people appreciate in, in my kind of uh, black white uh, idea. I think, uh, and that's what yeah stands out makes me stand out a little bit from uh, from other ones. I think maybe. And tell me, Kevin, logistic wise, um, you're a small batch brewer. But do you also sell the beers um, outside your own web shop? Let's say to bigger uh, retailers. Uh, yeah, there's, there's one because they supported me from the first start. It's Beerhal de Koning in Vichten. Uh, I know Stein and Melissa rather well. 
and they supported me. They also uh, did with the, go with the crowdfunding all. So for me, it seemed logic. Although it's a small thing, they only get one box or maybe two if I have a bigger batch. Uh, they also get one box for me, so I can supply the West of Flanders uh, with one with one box. And the rest is more this region, Antwerp. I think I have uh, we have uh, Hoogmis in Edigemeer. It's uh, they started with Vleesmeester Brewery. Uh, they now have a takeaway also, so they get a box too from me. And the rest is the yeah, the, the well known bars in, in Antwerp. You have uh, Billy's Beer Bottle Shop. We have then we have Beer Lovers Bar and Special Belge. Those are the three that regularly get. If there's something, I contact them or they contact me. Do you have something new? And then they get a box of me. It's just one box. It will be 24 bottles, sometimes 20. Depends how much stock I have. And uh, they get it. But those people supported me from the first day. I remember well the first day I was on Modest uh, Beer Festival in Antwerp. I think it was 2019. I was there with all my beer, the, the white uh, cedar black IPA. Uh, and the guys from uh, Special Bells came to me and said, okay, if ever, ever you have enough to sell, uh, we, want, uh, we want a keg, we want, uh, we want a box, something like that. And I kept that in mind. So when the one first day I had enough, um, they, yeah. they got my first, uh, my first box to, to sell them. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you do everything so, on bottles, eh? Of course. Uh, for now, yeah. yeah. The, the knife I did on a keg the first time, uh, I made it all together. Uh, thing again the second time on a keg it was for the modest uh, it was for the belgian beer week i think yeah uh, last year uh, i made it all together one time on a keg to tap uh, on uh, at special belge that's the first thing the rest of everything is on bottle um cans yeah i don't have really the place to put another canning machine or something like that so i do everything in bottles um I have a small system. I can even force carbonate and, and put in the in the bottle uh, without air. So that would be a thing for the Naipa, would be a good thing. So we don't have oxidation because the first one yeah. I just filled off uh, gravitarily. So uh, it had a bit of oxidation. That's why it also after three weeks, it wasn't that good anymore. Uh, so now I have this big system. It's one bottle by one to fill. Uh, it will take some time, but it will uh, be filled off under pressure, so you won't have the, uh, the oxidation. So I hope that helps. Uh, cans, yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of cans, honestly. Uh, I do understand the, the advantages of it. Uh, I also see some disadvantages of it too. Um, I don't know if you have to go deeper on that too. It's, that's my vision. Um, I have the luxury in my shop, I don't have windows. So for me, UV light isn't an issue. Uh, so for me, that big advantage of a can, so you can't have UV light in your beer, doesn't doesn't add up for me because there is no UV light here. So for me, that isn't a good thing. Uh, also, the second thing I think, cans, uh, they they're the tiny isle of foil they they made of, they catch much of uh, the heat gets more rap rapidly in your beer. If you have a glass bottle, I did the test one time for me a beer in a can. And in a, in a bottle, put it together uh, with a the thermometer in it. And the beer in the glass bottle was after two, three hours, you didn't even notice a big thing. I think one mm. degree. And again, it was already two, three degrees. Not that extreme, but I'm a freak uh, on, on, on that mm. thing, on, on temperature and uh, on, on light. So there is a difference. So if you have temperature changes, it will do more to a can than to a bottle, in my opinion. Yeah. Personal, and of course, personal. most of your beers are consumed uh, not in bars but by in people their house or outdoors eh? um yeah yeah true yeah that's also a thing so that doesn't have to be a disadvantage to have a bottle true yeah uh, also yeah everything is refermented in the bottle too um so that's another thing i think refermentation in, in the can is still a bit of a mm. or dangerous or doesn't work that well in a bottle you don't have problems with that so that's also a thing like in the US, everything is almost forced carbonate, then you don't have the problem for a can, for NIPAs and IPAs. Uh, but uh, re-fermentation in a can, it's still, you can have accidents or it doesn't go well. So I prefer bottles still. For my style of beers, I think that's a more thing. Not for the NIPA, of course, but the other ones, they hold up well in a, in a bottle. So um, I like that. And still, I like to open a bottle with a bottle opener and put it in my glass. I like it still more than, uh, than, than, than opening the can. That's uh, a personal thing. I'm not saying it's better or bad, but it's just a personal thing. 
in Belgium we're good with fermentation in the bottle style beers. So why should you go to a can just for for show of oh, it's it's yeah it's it's yeah it's more uh, hot something to, to to make something in a can. If you don't see the the advantage of it, you don't have to do it. I think just for selling it maybe, but. Again, that's not my thing. People will buy it in my bottle too, so I put it in a can. So, uh, yeah. My vision, my personal vision. <laughs> All right. um, you also mentioned your beer um, with special woods in it. Is that something you want to specialize in more in doing special woods in your beer? Yeah, yeah. It's a big, uh, big thing for me. The cedar was... Well, Actually, the cedar was my second beer with woods in it. The first one is, in fact, before the white cedar black IPA came out, I made a beer. The first beer I ever made was the black IPA of the Gunnison. Uh, that's the first official release beer in, I think it was 30 liters. Yeah, it was my first really commercialized beer. Uh, I was in the US, uh, I've been a few times in the US, and I wanted to bring something home from the US uh, to put in my beer here. Say, okay, my first beer has to be something special. I was thinking about water, taking water from uh, from the US to Belgium. <laughs> it was not a good idea to survive in the plane of North. So uh, the second thing, okay, an ingredient. I was trying to do spices or something. And then we went to walk uh, for a hike in the Black uh, Canyon of the Gunnison. And they have really big juniper trees. I said, juniper yeah. tree? That should be could be something, so uh, I uh, I took a branch. I didn't uh, hurt took the tree. It was a branch that was <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I took really something that was on the ground. I didn't uh, uh, damage the, the tree itself. Um, I put a, a branch. I put it in my suitcase. I tried to smuggle it because you, you're not allowed to smuggle it. In fact, out of the US. Uh, yeah. Like that. <laughs> in my uh, in my suitcase, just like this. It was uh, twenty centimeters something of wood. And when I came out, uh, I just cut it in small uh, small pieces and I brewed a black IPA and put it in. Just trying it, what would it do? Okay, I toasted the wood before to get uh, all the, the resins out of it, of course. And then put it in the, the fermenter to see what it would do. I did a little bit of research and there were some beers with juniper tree wood or really small barrels. I know uh, Ref from uh, uh, from Boca. As a really yeah. tiny barrel, also from juniper tree wood, a really small, it's, it's, it's a little baby. So it it's, it has been done already, but not a lot because yeah, it, it's a wood. If you don't use it at the right time, it can be poisonous. That's the first thing. And it will give a lot of a uh, strange taste. So you have to really know what you're doing. For me, it was a bit new, but I toasted it like I thought it would be good, and it actually turned out really quite good. There was a bit of a spicy touch in it. Uh, I brewed it twice, then the branch was uh, depleted, I didn't have any more, and returning really to the US was not a really, uh, I needed to go back uh, that soon, so I tried to find it with the same characters a little bit, and I came out to, to white cedar, not red cedar, because that's a bit different, has been done more, I think, if, uh, some brewer I know, do they use red cedar uh, wood, it's a more warm touch, but I wanted to do the spiciness I had in the in the juniper tree, coming back because in an IPA, I think that's a better thing than in stout. It wouldn't work the cedar, I think, but in, uh, in the black IPA, it works. Um, so I tried to find uh, the white uh, cedar wood and actually I found them in the US. It are planks uh, used to, to roast salmon on it, so to smoke salmon on it. Uh, so I bought a, a bunch of them. They came here. I just cut them in, uh, in small cubes. And I put it now in my fermenter. So uh, it was a bit trial and error, how much you have to use, when. But it turned out like uh, like I wanted it to be now. So I think this version, the the, white, the winter edition I made now, the, the last one, for me is the, is the best one. So that's really uh, how I want it to be. Uh, the more heavy black IPA, 8% ABV, and a lot of cedar. If you open the bottle, it's really, it comes here your nose. Not everyone likes it. I know that for sure. People say, oh, what's this? You don't put that in a beer. Possible, but I like it. And, and a, lot of, a lot of people, more than I thought of, like it. So, uh, yeah, I keep brewing yeah. it. And it for else, for tell me, song. as a as a small batch brewer, you also don't have to do beer festivals to promote your beer. And so, so... Um, no, I don't have to. I would love to. I did Modest as the first thing I did. Uh, we have a small local uh, beer festival here uh, in Kontig itself. It's called Beer Bed Streken. It's a, it's a small thing here. 
Um, it's not really for the beer geeks, in fact. But yeah, I was there already with my beer shop. So, uh, but it would be nice to be there with your own beers. So, of course, you have Billy's Craft Beer Fest. It would be an honor to be there. Uh, my biggest dream, in fact, is even uh, uh, the Hoften Dormal uh, Festival. Uh, say yeah. the name. I just lost it. Uh, Living mm-hmm. Innovation. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Living Innovation. So that's a really, yeah. But it's it's better you don't go there. You I want to go there. They have to ask you. So maybe yeah. one day, you know. But Voila, there are by two this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they have to they have to try their beers themselves, and if they like them, and it's something for them on their festival, for me, I would be honored to do it. If not, it's like that. Let's say it's a luxury. I don't need the festivals to think, but it just it's a nice thing to to be on a festival like that. It gets it's a bit of an award you get to be invited to be at the festival that's a thing for me a uh, lot of things for me just turn about is honor the most i think it's it's yeah it's a fancy word honor but most things i do yeah recognition that's a better word in fact um to be recognized as, as a brewer or yeah what's in the name a brewer just for your beers that's a nice thing i don't have to be, get rich of it that's not my goal just if people drink your beer and say oh that's not one of the better beers i drink or something really special it's not something i would drink every day but just that beer it was so complex i really liked it or i kept sniffing on it for an half an hour just to get the aromas for uh, me that that's yeah that's worth more than gold say like that so that's uh, that's my thing and if that was not enough you also founded brewware how did you do yeah. that <laughs> uh it started almost together with the beer shop i think yeah it was not much before the brewing no uh, yeah before the brewing in fact yeah 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 i did brew some home brewing but nothing uh nothing uh, official uh but i had to brew the beer shop already and yeah uh, if i wanted something like a t-shirt or something uh, you could buy a t-shirt from a brewery you know or you like and then he had also the t-shirt i call them the yeah the drunk shirts or something i'm with drunk or my beer meter is empty those things so i really i don't like them. i call them bachelor shirts uh bachelor party shirt because they're always about being drunk uh it's not really classy so there was nothing in between or you have to wear a t-shirt like i'm a more and i drink myself just uh just for the alcohol or you have to really support one brewery and another brewery doesn't like you're putting that shirt you're going don't put a brewery shirt from one brewery go to another so that was a bit for me i want something in between uh something yeah classy not snobbish but just more classy you could show that you like good beers honest brewed beers without really being attached to a brewery or just being called uh, a drunk or something like that so i started thinking about it the logo was quite simple uh just the ingredients of beer brewer underneath it uh so my idea behind it was in fact if you're wearing a brewer shirt or a trouser or anything you go to a bar and there's something sitting in a pub you never know but he also has a brewer shirt you see it you know that's something one who appreciates good beer because otherwise you wouldn't buy brewer stuff you would buy something like i'm drunk or just one that you know he likes good craft beer or uh, good beer honest uh, honest beer um so you get the connection so you know okay that guy knows something about beer don't have to be an expert but just know what's a good beer that was the idea behind it in fact so becoming a bit uh the nike we'll say the nike of the of the brewing clothing range or something like that if that exists already and, and how did uh, that uh, idea kicked off was there a good market for it no actually i don't think it was a big market i think in belgium if you would do it in the us it could work i think but belgium is so small um yeah. you have people who buy it of course and the idea people i know they like the idea about it but it's something yeah you don't just buy that often it i did some festivals with it so that was at the festivals at the brewer stand and then people buy a shirt but then buy it like they buy another t-shirt so it's, oh they liked it uh so i started off with some t-shirts i think and some hoodies that was the first thing uh, and in between i already was making more things because I didn't i designed the logo with the, with the guys i made them print it was not my own print so it's not handmade but then i started making uh barrel bottle openers too 
myself. I uh, make them from uh, from uh, barrel staves from Bokken, in fact. So I got them from Ruff, uh, new Ruff, a little bit. And they said, oh, you need uh, barrel staves? I have some. I just burn them either, but I have too much. So uh, come get some. And I just uh, saw them out by hand, the formula I liked about it. Uh, I made some bottle open for it. And I called them also Brewer, the same brand on it. Uh, and that's how it started off. And that's more a uh, thing myself. I'm working on them two hours for one piece. So it's really right. hand work. It doesn't, Labor intensive. Uh, yeah, it doesn't add up. But just for me, it's a bit of a, yeah, getting your mind empty, just sawing it, making it, doing something with your hands instead of uh, being behind the computer. Um, and yeah, it was also, again, thing recognizable of honor, like you say. If someone has an opener like that, made from wood by hand, it's yeah. a good thing. Okay, there's some nifty function, so your, your bottle cap keeps straight, so you can reuse it, or just for collectors, it could be a nice thing. And they have also a, a wax cutting function, so for the those uh, nasty bottle wax uh, beers they make, uh, you can uh, you just cut the wax and you, you can open it uh, well, just uh, without uh, being with a knife or something <laughs> like that. So, in fact, I made it, I wanted it myself, so I made it myself, for myself, and I made some more. That was the, the first thing. Uh, I made it really myself. Afterwards, I made also bottle holders to put your bottle in, like for Goethe style, instead of uh, the baskets. I made some things like that, yeah. all from barrel staves. So those things are really handmade by myself. Uh, now, I have to say, now it's less because I have less time, because I, I brew now a lot more. Uh, and of course, I did it outside, and at mint, uh, minus 10 uh, degrees outside, it doesn't really nice to, to be sowing and milling uh, outside. So it's more of a summer thing for me. So uh, I keep making them, but uh, not as much as I had. And also, there isn't a big market in Belgium. I say I sold in, in that time, I sold uh, a few hundred, I think, that was it. Um, but it's not a big market. And I sell them at uh, 15 euros. In fact, if you count your hours, it should be three times the price. But nobody will pay that. I understand that, but that's also the thing. Uh, it's more of a question of being recognized. Okay, I like the, the opener, and if they say, "Hey, your opener," I, I use it every day. For me, it's a big thing. Yeah. I like them. Uh, so that's uh, the same thing with the beer. So that's uh, that's my thing. All right, uh, Kevin. The final question: What are your plans after this pandemic? After pandemic, well, uh, I hope to be maybe at the festival. It should be a nice thing. But most of all, I would like to to get out my Naipa, a good one, just at the, uh, with a real uh, release. So I want to brew it, in fact, keg it, and then really make a, a Naipa event just one day, like they do in the US, in fact, a release for a Naipa. Everybody come here, just taste it that day, and it will be gone. That's my thing uh, I would love this year. Uh, that would be, would be possible, that would be nice. Um, the second thing is just travel back to the US. I've been a few times there. I made some brewery friends, so it would be nice to, to go back there, uh, taste some beer there, uh, get to know new styles or new beer or something like that. So that's the two main things for now I'm looking forward to. And of course, yeah, brewing new beers or make, make it a bit larger. I have started a barrel program too, a really tiny one barrel program. But uh, that's the thing too. I want to do more with real barrels. Uh, with things that never been done before. So I have now the bourbon barrels. That's one thing I think is rather unique in even the world, maybe, I think. Uh, second thing I want to do is maybe make uh, peat rum barrels. doesn't exist neither. Uh, but it's a blend of uh, rum and, and peated uh, stuff in, in a barrel. Um, so yeah, I have to try things that are not being done before. Not because I have to be special, but I can afford filling a barrel, mm -hmm. I have uh, 30 mm -hmm. liter barrels and 15 liters, I can afford, it's affordable to put 30 liters of, uh, of spirit in a barrel. If you do it in a big brewery, they can't afford to put uh, 10 barrels of 200 liters full of, of booze. Yeah. It's not possible. So I can do it, the experiment, and let's see what it does. It, it's for me, it's, uh, that's my biggest plus to be really small, I think. so. I'm going to try crazy things with wood. I still have a uh, different kind of wood. Uh, I want to try something with it. I tried a, a blonde beer, my only blonde beer I really made, uh, with uh, uh, Californian peach wood. Uh, okay. It turned out really nice. The wood isn't that good. Yeah, the guy I, I get the wood from, he just sent me a free sample and said, here, 
you have a kilo of uh, peach wood, try something with it. So, okay, I'm gonna try it, uh, but it wouldn't work in a stout, so I made it for a blonde yeah. beer. Uh, it turned out not that bad. Actually, it got an infection, it got a, a bread uh, infection, but in a good way. Uh, it really is a good beer, it just it doesn't, yeah, it's just out of the bottle, but the taste is really good. So that wasn't the best experiment. Uh, I sold a few cases in the beginning, it was okay. Once I knew the same thing again, like with the, with the Naipa, once I knew it wasn't really serviceable, uh, I just cut it off the market. I said, uh, I won't sell it anymore. So I drank them all myself. They are really delicious, but uh, not for sale. <laughs> cool, cool. That's, uh, that's my thing. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, uh, Kevin De Vos from Brewery Malcroes.